Hey there, welcome back to the Chifula in Agar. In today's episode, I'm chatting with the vibrant Hannah McDonald. From her journey to, in teaching to working in the family business to her insights about Gen Z's workforce, there's a ton of things that we unpack in this episode. So trust me, you won't want to miss this one. Let's dive in. As always, let me know what you think. Please share and subscribe to the podcast. Hannah, welcome to the Shift Podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. So at Shift, we're all about shifts, life shifts, career shifts, business shifts. And um, let's start off with some of your shifts and uh, the career that brought you to us talking today. Oh my gosh, shifts. I've done a handful of those. So I was born in Canada and I shifted to Virginia. We were just chatting about this really briefly. I did my undergraduate degree from Liberty University and I spent a little bit of time on campus there. Didn't love it. Shifted back home. <laughs> worked, uh, worked a full-time job and was a full-time student. At the exact same time, I had my head down and my thumbs up and I was saving for something. I had no idea what. And then one day I was on vacation in Florida and I was like, hey, I really love it here. I should move here. And so I shifted myself back to Florida. I lived in Florida for a little while. I moved in with a stranger I met on the internet. It was a crazy, <laughs> wild story. Um, and then I fell in love with being here and um, was hoping to live the rest of my life out here. But the world shifted and we had a global pandemic, which forced me back to Canada. It was not a force. It was a choice. I made the choice to go back home, but my family's business uh, was much more important than than being in a different country at that point and wanting to support them and what that looked like. So I shifted on back home to Canada. I lived there for a handful of years. And then uh, as nature would have it, I had met somebody here in Florida who I was dating at the time. And so I was traveling back and forth a lot through the pandemic, but uh, we got more serious and I moved back down here. And so we shifted the business up a little bit or shook it up better is a better word <laughs> for it, but it was still a shift. Uh, and I moved here to Orlando, Florida, where I opened up a, another part of the family business that we currently have today. We're the Better Together group of companies. So we're a group of staffing agencies and I helped take it across from a Canadian business to a Canadian and American business. So we've started to work a little bit out of here, but I also support a lot of the efforts there. Uh, and that's kind of what brought us to where we are today. Lots, lots of shifting, lots of moving, <laughs> um, lots of different places, but uh, quite the quite the journey and the experience. Yeah, very cool. How is it working with family? Working with your family is very interesting. So <laughs> I never anticipated wanting to work in the family business. In fact, none of us really did. My brothers, I have two brothers. They're older than I am. They're twins. And then my father and my mom all work in the family business. So my dad started it originally, and my mom has always been a silent partner to him. She sits in on so many of the meetings. She is the brain behind so much of the operation that nobody sees. Um, and that has always been kind of how it goes and they work together. But then a couple of years before I came in, one of my brothers wasn't quite sure that he was loving his experience through university and wanted a more hands-on experience. And so he transitioned to doing, oh, and the word is escaping me right now. Um, you work under somebody and you learn. Apprenticeship? It's the one. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> here's the spot you figured it out. out. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so he he wasn't living the typical education path at the time, and he was looking for an apprenticeship type of opportunity. And naturally, mm -hmm. that came available to him at the family business. So he transitioned in, and then one of my other brothers, or the other brother, graduated school, loved the education system, and wanted a eventually to go back into it. But the Canadian education system at the time didn't have a lot of opportunities. And so he ended up in the family business. And as the pandemic was happening, I did. So none of us really intended to, but it was the opportunity that was there. And, and that's kind of why my dad created it so that all three of us would have an opportunity to have a place to work should we want one day, someday. And that's how he always presented it to us. He never, he never made it seem like that was the right choice by any stretch of the imagination, just that it was available. And so we all came into it with the expectation of probably coming out of it. And we all really fell in love with the concept of working together, kind of as we started to do it. But working with a family business is like 
business with a heart is the best way to describe it. It is everything you do every single day, but just with a heartstring attached to it in some way, shape, or form. So it's uh, it's an emotional and amazing, really interesting uh, experience for sure. Yeah, I bet it is. I'm as you're speaking. I was like, I have a brother and two sisters, and I tried working with my younger sister. So I'm I'm the elder millennial. My brother's okay. a Gen X, and then I have two Gen Zs. Um, sisters and okay. so so we have like huge gaps between my sisters and I think that the 11 years between me and the next one and then 16 years between me and the, the little one and um and I tried working with so when I had my own company the first one company that I had now I have something else but back in 2019 I had another company and I hired her to kind of work with me and it was like I realized that I was like I don't have the patience I don't have the patience to like to mentor and to teach and all that. So like, you know, there's this family, but then you're like, you're like, that's your sister. And then there's this whole thing and et cetera. And same with my brother. Like I've tried to kind of do some things with my brother and we're just all so different. So kudos to you, honestly, for being able to like function and have a run business, expand your business. It's, it's really is, uh, it's not for everybody. I mean, I love my siblings, you know what I mean? They're the best. We all of it get along, but it's just, we just operate on different levels. It's mm -hmm. uh, so it's pretty amazing that you guys are able to, I'm sure it has its challenges, but the fact that you're still doing it speaks for itself. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it absolutely has its challenges. Boundaries would be our biggest challenge. We're not great at, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, the business conversation comes to the dinner table <laughs> for, quite frequently and the family conversation comes to the boardroom quite frequently, but we're working through that. But it's, I mean, like outside of that, it is really quite phenomenal I mean being able to like genuinely just love and care so much for the person that's sitting next to you and be like mm. I would do anything that I could to support you and and mean that and and mentorship aside mentorship and and guiding and teaching that is a hard game all of its own um and then when you add family to it it's really intense um but I think that when you when you can do it, it 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 can be really beautiful. As cheesy and corny as that sounds, it really yeah. can. <laughs> no, totally. And so you do a lot of work with Gen Zs. Mm, so where where does that come from? Is it just the like what do you the business is it around that population or tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I when I was living in Florida originally, I was doing my undergraduate degree and uh, finishing that out. And then I was a substitute teacher at the time. And this was pre pandemic. And so I was doing a lot. I kind of bounced around a little bit at the beginning from kindergarten through eighth grade, but I really fell in love with working with high schoolers. And people thought this was hilarious at the time because I was like a 20-year-old and I was walking into classrooms of 14 to literally 20-year-olds. I had somebody in one of my classes once who had failed a couple grades and was the same age I was. That was really interesting. Wow. But it, it prepared me for, for what was to come. But when I was working with them, I was really surprised by how little information they had about what a career world looked like. And because I grew up in staffing, this was very second nature to me. I, I kind of was, I, I tell people I was um, teething on transportation, like just teething on the, the industry from the time that I was a kid. So it was really ingrained in me. But as I was teaching these kids around me, their genuine knowledge about what the world looked like beyond the walls of their high school was so small. And that was so alarming to me. And so... As that came to an end and I moved back to Canada, I was working with a lot of people who were really boomer and Gen X kind of generation. We had really a really large age gap between me and my brothers and most of the other staff. And not that that's a bad thing. They were phenomenal employees and they were great coworkers. Um, but as we were starting to hire new people in, I went to my dad and I was like, so I love this but help a girl out. Like <laughs> give, me, give me somebody who's at least only half my age. Like if that, there was, there was people who were three or four times my age working with us at the time. And I was like, not that I don't love that. I just need a little bit more diversity to help mm -hmm. me see somebody who is similar to me, to see how I can compare, to see what I can grow to, to see a little bit of the path, but the difference between the two was so hard and so separate. So 
really that's kind of how it started. And then after we started bringing in some young blood and I progressed in my career, I got into a spot where um, we were bringing interns in and we had the opportunity to work with summer interns. Cause I was like, okay, do you see that? Do you see the energy? <laughs> do you see the drive <laughs> and the excitement that has come from these young people? And we were able to see that. And so talk to my dad again, let's, let's do more. Let's try this again. And we ended up doing, I think five or six cycles of five or six Gen Z's a term. And they kept coming back and kept wanting more. And then out of nowhere, this person randomly from LinkedIn reached out to me and was like, Hey, Hannah, I see that you're posting a lot about what you're doing. I see you're posting a lot about Gen Z stuff. I think that you'd be a really good person to talk about Gen Z's. Do you want to come to this conference and speak for me? And I was like, I mean, I suppose. (laughs) What do you, what do you want me to say? And she was like, I don't know. Why don't you tell me what you want to say? And so I took a really big step back and I was like, well, what have I learned? I've learned how to hire them and I've learned how to retain them. So let me try to teach people about how I've learned to do this. And Mm -hmm. that's kind of how the whole Gen Z thing came to be from a, a love of working with them as a teacher to a need to see the energy that they can bring to just pushing it forward and and continually driving into what the generation really has to offer. Mm. And it's like, you almost like grew with them in a way, like Absolutely. through that journey. Um, it's interesting to say how disconnected there was, and, you know, and, and for high school, I'm kind of like, I expect it almost, you know, uh, but for college, so not to name um, the particular school, but I was a couple of weeks ago, I was um, at this event and there was a lot of different universities and there were some really big schools there, um, big names, um, high ticket prices to go to those schools. And I was talking to some of the soon to be graduates and um, and I was, to your point, just as mind blown of how much there's lack of understanding, lack of mm. um education around the you know what it's like after they finish right like after they have these huge you know loans and huge on all that and just like the realities of what that looks like when you get out and the 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 gap of expectations between what they think they should be getting getting out and what they will actually be getting and how does the corporate world view evaluate their you know kind of value if you want to call it that and I hire Gen Z's now as well so I I also have a lot of those conversations and I'm curious um I'm curious to hear your thoughts because from my side when I interview people like Gen Z's coming in and it's almost like it's more of just like educating them about the realities of x y and z and they're very receptive I've never I don't think I've ever had a Gen Z who's like this is unacceptable you know or this is not you know this is not what I'm gonna get and da, 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 da. so I think it was just really just through conversations and then you I'm kind of able to still bring them on board and it's mm-hmm. you know have you had that have you had do you have any funny stories maybe of when you did have a conversation expectations were here and here like huge gaps like talk to me a little bit about that Yeah, all the time, consistently, regularly. (laughs) And I think that's across every generation. I mean, it's specifically hard with Generation Z because they are now becoming familiar with the realities of it. But I don't think that that's any different from the previous generations who have necessarily walked before them. I think that as you're coming into your adulthood, you are kind of just at any point in time left with the reality of what it's not like to be an adolescent anymore. But Because of this, uh, I experienced lots of these moments in life when I stepped into something and I was like, oh, that's not how it is. Okay, let me readjust my expectations and figure out how to move on from here. But it's funny that you mention it because so many of those things had happened to me that I ended up writing a book about it. So are you a rated podcast I don't want to go for it it. okay so the name of the book that I wrote is well shit and the (laughs) whole concept behind it is it's time to grow up and so there are so many things that are phenomenal about being a kid and Mm -hmm. being a teenager but eventually those things come to an end and so it's kind of a a a gift, a love gift that I started to give some of the people in my family as as a story. I kind of originally just was jotting down different things that they had taught me and was going to give it to my someday kids as like a, a different um, keepsake for them. And it blew up into a book. But the whole thing is just littered with these different experiences about, oh, 
that's what happens in life. Okay, well, let me <laughs> let me take a step back and reevaluate and figure out what we're going to do here. So, yeah, there is mm. there's so many that there's a full book full of them. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um you know, when I when I was a young person kind of graduating from college, I got really lucky. Uh, I've had a lot of like random jobs since I was 15. But when I got into kind of my career job, you know, post post school, I was very lucky that my first one, I had a really great manager. And she was just, you know, she would invest in me, she would mentor me and so on. And then several years later, also then had a really great manager. And so I always look back because a lot of people talk about Gen Z's, right? And kind of the, you know, the difficulties of working with Gen Z's. But then I wonder if a lot of it is also on the manager and knowing how to motivate a young employee, how to mentor them, how to coach them, how to understand what drives them versus just like these Gen Z's are so, you know, demanding mm -hmm. uh, and so on, right? So I wonder, you know, how, how do you view that? And for you as somebody who's a leader in your organization, like in your company, what is that? How, how do you relate to that? Yeah. Well, I, it's funny that you say it because as you were talking a couple minutes ago, I wanted to mention this and then I forgot and blew past it. But your your note about, I've had lots of Gen Zs I've hired. They've sat down across from me. I've talked to them about what the reality is and they've accepted it and it's been perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. So I would say that that's attributing to you uh, communicating very, very well. <laughs> I think most of the time when managers and Gen Zs are conflicting or fighting or mad at one another for one reason or another, it typically draws back to communication. The way that the manager is communicating with the employee or the way that the employee is taking the communication. And this is something that I talk a lot about in my presentation is that even if the manager thinks they are saying the right thing, the way that the next generation is interpreting what they're saying might be out of their current understanding. And so even if you think you're 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 perfectly fine, really relevant, really effective, if Gen Z after Gen Z after Gen Z is walking away from you, not coming back the next day, not responding to your interview follow-ups, there's there is a reason. Mm -hmm. And so it's probably somewhere in that communication. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a two-way streak. It goes both ways for sure. Yeah, I think there's this misconception that we expect to your point, like you you think you know they should know X, Y, and Z, but actually they need some really harsh expectation setting and very clear communications. That's what I found helpful at least. Is like and I think everybody, I mean, to be fair, it's not even a generational thing. I mean, I've worked with all generations that are just like expectation communication is a challenge for all of us, like across yes. board. But then you you incorporate, you know, on top of that, you put lack of experience in the real world, fresh graduate, uh, having a very consumer mentality, right? Because we consume, consume, consume from high school to college. We just get given information and everybody tells us what to do. What does success look like? You just need to get good grades. You need to get into good schools and so on, right? And then you get into the workforce and now you need to be a producer and a creator. And you've never done that before and nobody tells you. And on this side, they feel like you should know. You have no idea and we don't know what we don't know. And then we end up in this conflict of generations <laughs> yeah absolutely you could you could double the sound on that <laughs> repeat it over and say it louder for the people in the back um yeah that is a hundred percent correct and one of the things that I talk a lot about in the presentation well first I talk about okay these generation z's have been like the influenced generation, right? We created the concept of the influencers from Gen Z's. And so these Gen Z's from the time that they were kids, I mean, I got social media when I was in sixth grade. So let's say if I'm the average, and I'm a fairly average human, um, if I'm the average Gen Z for more than half of my life, I have had people trying to influence me from every way, shape, and form around me. So, mm -hmm. so many of the Gen Zs have built up these really intense walls that are big because everything is trying to influence us. And so we are letting our um, influence-ness, our <laughs> ability to be influenced, however that's properly supposed to be said, our ability to be influenced is decreased because it's happening all of the time. And so it has uh -huh. to be really substantial for it to be effective. So when a Gen Z comes into the workplace and their manager is like, duh, 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 this is what needs to be done. Yes, we take direction, but the influence that that person has over us 
is much more minimal. And so to create that influence, you have to first build like a mutual respect with the employee. And then as mm. you do that, the employee starts to take their wall down. But before that, it's really hard to like have that effective communication because you're right. Everybody's just back on top of one another, not really understanding what the other person is looking for, which is mm. really hard. But yeah, yeah. communication is everything. <laughs> yeah. And that really ties into also your reputation in the workplace. You shared a story that, you know, because you're so active and you do a lot of content, you've written a book around certain topics, you almost created this personal brand around you that you have your professional brand, but then you also have this personal brand of Hannah that is, you know, speaks about Gen Z's or, you know, on these kind of topics. And so how, you know, and one of the things I struggle with when I work with a lot of the younger, not just the younger, again, I think it's a cross board, but because I, I recruit a lot of Gen Zs, um, it's relevant that I guess at that age, and this is my, my assumption, right? And I'm, I want to hear your thoughts. Yes. At that age, when you're in your 20s, you're not really thinking about larger picture of your career, right? You're just like, listen, I just want to get paid. I want to do this job. You might not yet have responsibilities, family to worry about, older parents to worry about for most of us, right? So you're kind of just like, I'm just going to do this job. I just want to get paid. I can care less who knows about me. I can care less about creating a brand. I can care less about networking and all those things. And then usually I see like after 30 people, like, wait a minute, like I, you know, especially when you start doing career changes or changing jobs in general, it's like, wait, I, nobody knows who I am. And like, nobody, like, no, you know, I don't know, I know how to present myself. And I try to incorporate this in all the young leadership, like young talent pipelines that I do is like, think about your brand, think about your reputation. So how mm -hmm. do you, because you, you're a good example of that. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think you're right. Is, is your question, should it be done or how to do it? Both. Okay. Well, yes, I think it should be done. I, I it, Depending on the field that you're in, how you do it is completely different. Mm -hmm. But if you're thinking about your career in a very long scheme, you want to create, yes, not only the activities that you have to do to do your job every day, but the reputation that will carry you forward into the next thing that you are going to do. Um, I just, I think it's a really good way to look at the future of my life and be pretty intentional about trying to help set myself up for success. So I think it's great to be done, but how do you do it? That's a much harder question to answer. I think it has to start with what do you want, right? Mm -hmm. what do you, what do you want from it? If you're creating a personal brand, what's your goal? And so for me, I look at it and I go, well, my goal is to share information with people that they don't have access to that can help them get and make the best decisions that they can for themselves at those moments in time. That's kind of, at least this year, that's what my real goal is, is I've had the pleasure of working in staffing my whole life. I've had opportunity stacked on opportunity, and that has gotten me to this phenomenal place. But now what can I do as a human to take all of that information I've had the pleasure of learning and give it to people? So I'm doing that through books. I'm doing that through courses. I'm doing that through um, communication. Mm -hmm. But the way that I get to do that is through the way that I promote those things. So I got to go back to the social media. And then on social media, I start to talk about those things. So I talk mm -hmm. about the different types of books. I talk about the different types of information that I'm creating and producing. And I do it, I do it on LinkedIn. I do it on TikTok. I do it kind of depending a little. I, those are really my two favorites right now. TikTok for employees, how to get a job, how to talk to your employer, how to uh, call in sick for work, how to ask for a raise, kind of some of those very awkward questions that people are sitting at home Googling it at, mm -hmm. at 11 p.m. at night because they just are continually thinking about that thing. And then on the flip side, on LinkedIn, I do how to connect with your Gen Zs, how to hire the right person, how to hire somebody who's uh, intense, has intentionality and integrity. That's something we talk a lot about at the Better Together group. So I, I figure out what I want to do. Then I figure out what that looks like. And then mm -hmm. I figure out how to how to help people get the things that I'm trying to get into their hands. And so it really starts with what do you want? Mm -hmm. And then how do you do it? And then how do you get people to see it so that mm -hmm. they can get it into their hands? And I mean, that applies over anything and everything, but that would be at a very basic, yeah. <laughs> basic over eye view, how I would suggest somebody start to build their personal brand. 
Yeah, I actually really like that. It's very simple. It's very practical. It's to a point. If you don't know where to start, because a lot of people get stuck, I think it's spot on. It's perfect. I love that answer. Um, How do you hire Gen Zs and how do you maintain them? What are some tips and strategies you shared at that talk that you gave? (laughs) What can you share with us? Absolutely. I should I should share the link with you so people have access to the full yeah. presentation because I'd, I'd love to get it out more. But I think first you want to understand who they are, where they come from. So we start the presentation by talking a little bit about what makes a Gen Z a Gen Z. So we talk about technology. We talk about COVID. We talk about some of the, the fundamental life events that have happened for them uh, and kind of what that plays out and looks like in their life. And then we talk about what they want at work and what that might look like. And then we talk about what that needs to look like for the employers, because these are two-way relationships, something to give and something to get, right? Employees got to do the job that they come to do. But Mm -hmm. as an employer, you want them to show up the next day. So how do you get them to come back? And that kind of results in uh, talking about these two things specifically, uh, flexibility and, oh gosh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's okay it's on the tip of my tongue it's right there <laughs> flexibility and oh something yummy that's the one uh, so we talk about gen z's love flexibility every generation has something that they kind of like put their hat on right and so mm-hmm. flexibility will be what that is for gen z because of the way that they were raised with technology and through covid and so that kind of has shaped their their desires in the workforce and flexibility has come out as the main key thing for them and what they're chasing. But then on the flip side of that, that's not something yummy. That's just something good, right? It's the way they do what they're doing, but not what's being done. So you want to give them what I consider a big steak on the end of a stick. And it's something that they can look forward to that they feel like they're being effective at. And so, yes, Maybe you're hiring your Gen Zs to do filing. Yes, maybe you're hiring your Gen Zs to do your phone calls. Maybe you're hiring them to set your appointments, whatever that looks like. It's not the most fun job. And Mm -hmm. so let's think about what is something that would interest them, that they would be good at, that would benefit the company, um, but you wouldn't necessarily think to give the first employee. So for us, this very naturally started with social medias. Right, our Gen Zs love social medias, mm-hmm. and so for one or two or three hours a week, we would give them the opportunity to go out and create content that they can post through our social medias, and that gave them something that they were excited about and thinking about as they were coming to the end of the week, and again, kept them coming back for more. So mm-hmm. it's kind of it's it's a little bit of everything and anything, and then. The last thing I would really say is important for Gen Zs is helping them understand their why. Why mm-hmm. Why are you asking them to do this? Why are they showing up every single day? Why is what they do beneficial to the company, to you as a manager, to society as a whole? Why? They, they're very curious human beings. And if you can yeah. answer that why and you can give them something yummy and you can offer flexibility, you'll have a very dedicated Gen Z employee. Yeah, I I do also a lot of work with managers. And that's one of the things that we talk about quite often is, you know, the future manager, the future people manager, the future leader needs to uh, be transparent, right? Like there's a transparent in that communication, transparent in, and I think people in general appreciate that, but I think Gen Zs in particular, right? Like just understanding, because when they're kind of just starting off in their career, it's a little bit unclear why you have to do certain things that might be very mundane and like very just boring and not exciting, but they need to understand it's part of the larger machine. And it's like, that's just how it is. Everybody starts, most of us, unless you're super lucky or a genius, most of us start from the bottom. It's the just bottom. what it is. You know yeah. what I mean? Even in family business, I'm sure it's the same. Like it's probably like, you all, it's just, it's just, it's a process. It's a process and it takes time. And only a few of us are able to skip a few steps and, you know, a, a few, a few of those stairs, but a lot of times to climb that ladder is just what it is. Absolutely. Um, and Absolutely. Um, so when, when I, when I speak with managers and that's kind of like a big focus and I, and I always push back on the managers as well, because again, like you can have a Gen Z that is super motivated, that is that has a lot of great potential. But if you don't have somebody on the other side who's able to get that potential out of them, who's able to maintain them, to your point, who's able to give them that stake at the end of that really boring thing that they might have to do all week, that that Gen Z is either going to go somewhere else, so they're just gonna, not going to be as productive as they could actually be, and not as fulfilled with what they're doing. So mm-hmm. it's um, 
Yeah, I, I like to see it like from, I always say there's different responsible parties here. <laughs> it's not yeah. all on that one side, you know, it takes, yeah. takes a few stakeholders. Absolutely. Yeah, we found that honestly, when we followed that formula, our Gen Zs are able to give us more than they anticipated they could have. Like it's one thing to get your Gen Z to show up and to give you everything that they've got. It's a whole mm. other thing to be like, hey, I know what you've got, but I think you've got more. And like, how can I help you get there? And what can we do together to increase your capacity and see what that next thing looks like? And it's, oh my gosh, I mean, it's rewarding because a lot of work gets done. It's great to see the the ball move forward, but it's so rewarding to be like, wow, look at that human who's literally blossomed while being here. So it's really, it's really fun. Yeah. And what motivates you to to want to continue just in business to grow, to want to share your message? Like what is the what is the ultimate motivating factor for you? Yeah, we feed families one shift at a time. And that was my dad's original motto was he's like, we we feed families one shift at a time. Um, we create the jobs that are available for them. We don't create them. We create the opportunity that they can get them and we give it to them. And the mine is just a little bit different is uh, we give people the opportunity to feed their families one shift at a time. Yes, we are an agency. Yes, we can help place you without a doubt. And I want to do that. And I want to help you find your job. But I also want to give you the information that can help set you up to be the best person that you can be mm-hmm. so that you can help the people that come behind you, whether it's your kids or your friends or your family or whatever that looks like. But if we can help you get that that bottom base of the Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, right? Food, shelter, food and shelter. Let's start there, right? Let's yeah. feed your family. Um, but yeah, that that gets me out of bed every morning. Just mm. the opportunity to do that is incredible. Is there a question that you wish podcast guests would ask you and you you maybe you thought of something for this one? You're like, I hope she's gonna ask me, or I hope I get a chance to talk about this that I have not asked yet. Um, what's next is good. Like, what do you, yeah. like, what do you want to do kind of moving out of this? You have a couple, um, books that you're doing. I've got a new one I'm trying to work on. It'd be fun to talk about. Yeah. All right. Tell me about that. So I started the series. It's, I think it's going to be a series, which is overwhelming to say, but I think it's going to be a child series, a, a kid's book series about male dominated industries and seen through a female's perspective. Mm. So I work in a lot of male dominated industries, right? Manufacturing, transportation, they're very male dominated. Mm-hmm. And I love it. It's a phenomenal place to be. It's a great community. It's a great room. It's a great opportunity, but females just don't know a lot about transportation or manufacturing or a number of male dominated industries Mm -hmm. because they're not seen as like female friendly, let's call it. And so boys get dump trucks and (laughs) tool belts And all of these really fun toys that help set them up to be in some of these amazing trades that can help make them so much money and such an incredible future. But so many females are missing out on these opportunities because they're not hearing about them from the time that they're young. And so because kids start to think about their their future careers at the age of four, and then at seven, they kind of start to solidify some of those dreams And then at 12, they start to choose courses that they'll take in high school. And then at 17, they start to apply to universities. And those courses that they've already taken are already affecting what they can and cannot do in the future. Mm. It breaks my heart that we don't introduce these things to all kids of Mm -hmm. any way, shape, and form. And so I really want to work on a series where it's encouraging parents to talk to their children about what jobs look like, about Mm. what look like about what opportunities look like for their kids in the future and through a really fun story and it's going to be made so that the kids can really enjoy it I don't want to sit them down and teach them a lesson and be like this is what you'll do but I want them at their most influential age to be influenced for something that can support their best future Mm -hmm. Uh, 
So I actually just a couple hours ago had a really, I've been stuck on this idea for a really long time about how I was going to kind of start to curate it. And I broke through whatever writer's block I had this morning and wrote half of the first story, just all <laughs> sitting at my computer and pounded it out really quickly. Uh, but I've been thinking about these books for probably a year and mm -hmm. I'm, oh my gosh, so excited. And they're so far from finished. So far from finished. I got to find an artist. I got to put them together. I got to figure out how to promote them and do the whole thing. But it's so important to me mm. to do it. So yeah, that's hey. that's something I'm really excited about. That sounds pretty cool, actually. Listen, one story at a time. That's it. One story at a time. You'll get through it. Um, that's a whole other podcast. I would love to have you back on when you when you do release that. I'm sure it's going to be sooner than later. I'm Probably. sure. You, so Probably. you seem very excited about it. So <laughs> I think it'll be sooner than later. Uh, before I ask you my last question, what where can people find you? Where do you hang out at the most digitally or where can they yeah. contact your agency? Yeah. Uh, we are the better together group of companies, so you can search us online, but if you're looking for kind of all of my links and all of the random things that we do, uh, you can find me on x2toz.org, and that will take you to a spot where you can find all of the books that we've written and kind of get some PDF documents of everything. And of course, you can find the books online on Amazon um, and get hard copies, but they're free for download on that website, so check them out there. Sounds good. I'll make sure to put it in the show notes. The last question I ask all of my guests, uh, yes. what is one question you wish people would ask themselves more often? Why? Why do you do what you do? Just, yeah, just why? Just be a little more intentional about everything that's going on. I love it. I love it. Why? It's, it's a question that I... um often ask myself lately because I'm so I, I wear multiple hats in my life and I sometimes get so busy and I'm like do I really need to do this why am I doing this mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it's uh it, it's it's a it's a lifelong question that I think everybody should ask themselves continuously yeah yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. It's it's interesting internal reflection. I've been trying to do it for myself the last couple of months. Like just like what you said, taking on a new mm -hmm. role, a new title, um, and lots of new responsibilities that come with it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. why? Mm -hmm. Why does this need to be done before 5 p.m.? Why does this need to be done after 5 p.m.? <laughs> why can it not wait for tomorrow? Why is it important? Yeah, all all of the whys. Why do I wake up in the morning um, and yeah. do what I do? Which when you keep that at the forefront of your mind makes it a lot easier to do. So yeah. I love, I love the why. Absolutely. Well, Hannah, thank you so much. We will speak again, I'm sure, when you release the new book. So please do come back and uh, we'll love to share, share that story. So thank you so much for today. Thank you. This was so much fun. Mm -hmm.